Welcome back to Stylized Station, a channel dedicated to helping you learn game art. For those of you who have been watching the channel for a while, I actually have a really fun throwback for you guys today. It's a Substance Painter tutorial. The very talented Laura is going to give us a masterclass today on hand painting and procedural texturing using the Substance Painter. And she's going to give us a ton of tips and tricks on how to elegantly and skillfully mix procedural texturing with a bit of hand painted flair. I actually learned a lot from this video. And for everyone who is subscribed to the channel, I am super excited to announce that our Black Friday sale officially begins today. So if you really want to learn how to create stylized and anime style textures, and how to create beautiful environments like the one you see on your screen here, you can check out my two courses, which are now 50% off for the next three days only. This really is the lowest price the courses have ever been, ever. So I really hope this gives some people the opportunity to enjoy quality courses for a really affordable price. I'll leave a link in the description for your discount. Now, let's get into the video. Hey there everyone, my name is Laura Forbes and I'm a 3D and 2D artist from Canada. Today I will share with you my process for creating this little scene I made for a friendly Pokemon fan art challenge featuring Oddish. I'll share with you some tips I like to use when making a stylus project, we'll go through some of the sculpting process in ZBrush, but mostly I'm going to show you how to realize a quick and simple hand painted look for your models using the many tools of Substance Painter. We're gonna talk colors, what kind of generators to use, and tricks that are going to help make your textures pop. Let's get started! So first, we're gonna need a model! Starting off in ZBrush, I like to keep my references close right here in the spotlight while I sculpt. You can turn the spotlight on and off if needed, so it's very handy. Make sure though to turn off the spotlight projection in your brush settings to be able to use all your usual tools with no problems. When it comes to sculpting stylized character and objects, my go-tos are the Orb Curve and the Orb Flatten Edge from the Orb Brushes Pack by Michael Vicente in the classic clay builder brush in ZBrush. For Oddish, the sculpting is pretty simple. His body is mostly a sphere but with personality and feet. The tricky part are the leaves on his head. For those, I started off with a plane that I deformed to my liking, on which I then added veins with the Orb Curve switching between adding and subtracting matter to get some nice edges just like this. A plane is easier to manage than a very thin mesh. It just makes life easier, trust me. Now all I need to do once I'm happy with the details is extrude to the thickness I want and we still get all the sculpted details without risking the mesh collapsing on itself. After that, it's time for the surrounding scene. I went for a big log or root with some moss made from a mask and grass blades. The grass blades were made the same way as the leaves, and for the bark of the log, I went back and forth with the clay buildup and orb curve to define some lines. Nothing too complicated for the sculpt, pretty simple shapes, and keep the details pretty chunky. I then made a quick retopology using zero mesher with some guides to help the program and made the UVs with Rhythm UVs. Now on to baking! For this model, I did the baking directly in Substance Painter, but if you can, I would recommend baking in Marmoset instead. The quality and control is overall better, but since this model was pretty simple, I opted for the Substance this time and jumped straight into textures. The baked mesh maps are going to be pretty important to make our base material to start blocking colors. With that said, all we need is the base color of our model, so let's go and single out the base color channel. Also, I'll be using a resolution of 2K here, which will be plenty enough for this small project. Alright, we're all set. Now for that base material. What I did for this project is that I went ahead and created a smart material with the kind of baked light I wanted. I wanted a sunny and warm light. Let me show you how I did that with matte. Starting off with a fill layer, I chose a leafy green color. Kind of dark, but not too much since we're going to light it up quite a bit in a moment. Make sure you only use the color channel of all the following layers, and let's add our baked light. To achieve that, we'll add a filter to a fill layer called Baked Lighting Stylize. At this point, you can change the light source direction as you wish right here. Personally, I'm good with the basic option. As you can see, we kind of lost the green in the process. To fix that, let's change the layer mode to soft light, and since I don't need it to be extra strong, I turned down the opacity to around 25. 
Now that we can see most of our details, we got a base guide for our light. But we're not quite done yet. Let's go back to the base color of that baked light and change it for a not only brighter green, but also something more on the yellow side. Here, let me show you why. As you can see, on the right side, the shading is done by adding white for the light and black for the shadows. But on the left side, the light is not only a brighter shade, but it's also a warmer one, and the shadows are a cooler version of our base color. The black and white shading can muddy up our green, but by using the warm and cold shading instead, we get a much more saturated and vibrant shading. Depending on the environment of your model, for example if your lighting has a specific color like red, you might not want to follow exactly this rule of shading, but in general it's a pretty good rule to use. And it's the shading rule we're going to follow for this project. Now back to Matt. What I'm going to do next here is add an ambient occlusion generated fill layer with a nice transitional green to complete our base gradient of light. To do that, we add a fill layer and connect our ambient occlusion map in the black mask. I told you the green was going to get lighter. Now that we have some pretty sweet colors down, let's add some grit to that gradient. New fill layer, which means new shade of green, more saturated and following our rule, warmer and a little brighter. Add a black mask to this and then a light generator. Basically what we're going to do here is add highlights. We had light, yes, but we're also introducing my best friend the blur slope to add texture. What the blur slope is going to do is blur out the edges in a kind of chunky patchy way that is very fun for stylized textures. You can set it to your liking, kind of like when you use a more heavily textured paper for watercolor. This is usually how I mimic brush strokes without having to freehand everything. Now let's duplicate it to create the very top highlight color. A highlight that catches the highest concentration of light. Let's increase the gloss of the light generator and let's make it very yellow. Now that we've got our texture highlight, we need to do the same for the shadows. All we need to do is duplicate the previous layer and invert the light generator so it shows the shadows. And instead of adding yellow and going brighter, let's remember our rule, we add blue and go darker. You can tweak the final gradient to your liking by adding contrast between the layer colors or with the glossiness option of the light generator. And that's it! Make sure you name your layers accordingly and we can go ahead and put them in a name group folder to create our smart material we can use in any future project. Like Oddish! Grab that smart material and apply it everywhere, blocking sections for each object with masks as we go. There's two ways you can change the colors of the smart material. You can either directly change the colors of the fill layers, or you can add a colored fill layer of the desired color on top and change its mode to tint or soft light. I found that I really like the second way a little better with those really nice gradients that all have that kind of green influence going on. Now that we have our colors all blocked, it's time for definition and details unique to each piece of the scene. Starting with the ground, I went for a fill layer with a cloud noise mask combined with a blur slope to add variation of colors. Then I went on creating a kind of spotlight effect to frame the whole thing a little better with a dark bluish green on the edges. This one I painted manually with the artistic heavy sponge brush, my favorite! with a low opacity to build up the color gradient until I was happy with it. Now that the shadow is done, let's go for the light of the spotlight. Same thing, fill a layer with a lighter color, black mask, same brush, and paint where the most light would be. In this case, front middle. On a new fill layer, I painted some spots for a kind of brownish dirt color variation on some areas. Then for a nice detailed texture effect to mimic grass lines and add structure, I used the anisotropic radial projection for my mask. I placed it off-center to get some focus on the log here, but you could leave it in the middle as well if you wanted. Added a few darker areas with some generated clouds and some spots here and there to jazz it up, and that's it for the ground. Now onto the grass blades. Nothing too complicated here. We got our base, we got a little fill layer to tweak the colors a bit, and then I added a first shadow layer to match it with the spotlight shadow of the ground. No generators, nothing too fancy. The next layer is a little highlight for the top of some blades that would get hit more directly by the sunlight. After that, I wanted more definition on the details of the blades, so I went for a curvature generated fill layer with a darker green. 
really makes the lines pop and add a very nice contrast. To finish up, I added random cloud generated shadows on top of it all, keeping it light in the middle. Now it fits much better with the ground and is way less linear. To continue on with the greenery, it's moss time! For this one, I really wanted to go for that spotted look since moss is basically a lot of tiny kind of leaves. Again, friendly reminder to gather up references before starting any project. It is quite important! To achieve that spotted look, I added two fill layers, one dark and the other pale, with slope blurred clouds of different sizes and randomness to get a lot of color variations. I then realized I wanted a more yellowy and paler green for my moss, so I added a fill layer as a tint layer to shift the color. Happy with that, I went ahead and added spots to give more details like tiny holes in the moss. Now it was time to add the scene related shading, starting with a little blue detail shading from a cloud mask and then a stronger shadow on a new layer, manually painted on to up the contrast and really anchor the moss in the scene. Having a low opacity is really the best way to get those gradients right. Plus, I used this layer to sharpen some details of the sculpt here and there. The last thing I added was another little color variation for some little orangey spots to fit with the log a little better. And there you have it, moss! Next and last piece of the scenery, the log! As said before, for the log, I went on and changed the colors directly in the base material that we made earlier, keeping in mind the same rule of dark, cold, light, warm. I then added a painted layer of shadows casted by the proximity of the moss, the ground and the grass with a dark purpley red. Now we get this really nice color scheme going on. To help tie even more the log to the scene, I added a green layer for light moss and helped the transition with the ground with a nice blur slope. Then for a final step, at least for now, on the log, I deepened some of the details with some inverted curvature and a little paint of a sheer deep red purple. With that, we're done with the environment stuff and it's finally oddish time! Starting with the body, we've got our main colors blocked in with some soft light fill layers. To that I added a plain paint layer and sharpened all the tiny faces features. Went back and forth with my trusty artistic heavy sponge on a low opacity, changing colors according to the cold and warm rule to give this little guy a friendly face. For the eyes, I went for a really glossy gem-like aspect with the little specular at the bottom here and a more intense shine on top. Fix blurry features and defined the mouth shape. I made sure to really highlight the edges of all the features to make them really pop. I continued on with the details by adding a manually painted highlight to make him all shiny. It's at this point that I decided to add blush to crank up the cuteness factor. Following that idea, I also added freckles. To match with the rest of the scene, I added some very faint dirt color variation as well. Last thing to add was a heavier shadow at the base of his leaves right on top. Talking about leaves, they are the last part left to texture. I changed up the base color a tiny bit with a fill layer on soft light mode and went on to add a passive deep purple ambient occlusion. Tweaked a bit of the levels of the occlusion map connected for more contrast and that looked pretty good! Next were some highlights hand painted and I wanted them extra glossy and vibrant. I then added a fill layer to sharpen those deeper details for the veins, mixing painted details and an inverted curvature. Now the contrast is much more apparent, and we're pretty much done at this point. But just as a little finishing touch, I added a few little sharper highlights to Oddish and the log to up the contrast even more and to give it a really nice little bloom shine. And ta-da! All done! Export those base color maps and you're good to go! Now for renders, remember to keep your model shadeless, since the light is already painted on. For Oddish, I first use Sketchfab to share my project. It's very easy to use, and it's free. You can find the shadeless option right here. And have fun with filters and effects. I also imported the model into Marmoset to give you that really nice turnaround you saw at the beginning of the video. 
Don't forget to set your diffusion to unlit to get that shadeless effect. Now you know my base recipe for hand-painted looks. Depending on the project, I sometimes change the size and visibility of the paint strokes and how smooth the color transitions are. But that's pretty much it. Everyone has their own way to paint textures, and don't hesitate to experiment to find a workflow that works just for you. I hope this project breakdown helped you in your quest for hand-painted and stylized textures, and no matter what, please remember to have fun. Thank you to Stylist Station for this opportunity. I had a lot of fun making this video. Subscribe to the channel! Don't forget to like this video if you enjoyed it, and if you have any questions, comment down below. You can find me on ArtStation and Instagram for future projects. Links in the description. Have a nice day and take care, everyone.